2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18 tonight. <clears throat> but first, let's pray, because I need all the help I can get. Father, we come to you tonight knowing that you're good, even though we don't always understand what your path is doing and where you're going with it. We know we can trust you, so we ask that you would help us to do it. We praise you that you are, that if you never did anything for us, you're still good. And so help us to trust you. Lord, we pray for the rulers of our land. We pray for the situations in the higher offices in our state and in our country. Lord, that you would bring some sort of sense to the chaos. And, um, you said to pray for our rulers that we might lead a good and peaceable life. And so we really need to buckle down, I reckon, and pray. You said that if your people would pray that you'd heal the land. And so we just pray that we would draw together with one heart. Thank you. We pray for those who are ill. Think of Vicki, Lord, as she's home with hospice. Um, <clears throat> being kept comfortable right now just pray for her that you keep her heart and mind and if you if it's consistent with your will lord you can heal her we know you can we'd ask you to do that not give her the peace lord, help steve as he tends to her and uh, help him to be at uh, peace as well and thank you for how he's manned up and uh, taking care of her and just pray you continue to that he'd continue to have trust in you as well also for ricky kelly lord as he's home from the hospital now help him to heal up from his his sickness, and I uh, just pray that he'd be able to be back around and about your work again pretty soon. Many others, Lord, we thank you this morning for praise reports from Velma for her family and how things are going with her. Uh, we know that you do hear our prayers. We know that when you don't answer them the way we want, sometimes, Lord, you've got a bigger plan than we can understand. So just help us to trust you if we can't. Trace your hand, trust your heart. Lord, I, I love that quote, and I think it's valuable for us all. Uh, as we look at this tonight, just look at some principles drawn from this passage. I just pray that it would be helpful to us in our, our walk and our relationships. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Show a little bit of love and kindness. Wayne had to sing that song. That's a good one. The Apostle Paul here, now he's writing to this church. We're still kind of in the introduction here. And Paul finds himself having to defend himself. He had to do that a lot. Now, I tend to not defend myself. Sometimes I don't have to. Once in a while, my brother will defend me, or another brother will say, Hey, you got this wrong. I figure, all right, what does it matter? I'm thinking of a man a number of years ago who was running his mouth about something that I allegedly had done to undermine him, and he ran his mouth at the wrong place. And I don't, I don't say anything, but that brother said, now, just a minute here. <laughs> Here's what really happened, and blah, 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 blah. He was red-faced, and I was just vindicated, I guess. It didn't matter to me. But the Apostle Paul... Remember, he's writing as a, an emissary of God. He's writing as an authoritative speaker for, for Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And so he has to defend himself. And by the way, there are instances in which I would defend myself. I'll go, I, don't, I didn't say that. I'm going to edit that out. No, not really, I don't. But, but it's not like that. But there are times if someone impugns my name in such a way that it's going to bring a damage upon the church, we have a recourse. Uh, I remember a friend of mine, great great man, minister, a number of years ago, somebody was really putting him down, and he got a letter in the mail from a law office. That was the end of that. But I'm not so sure how far down that road I would want to go. But Paul, in particular, he's being put upon by the Judaizers. These were the guys who were really upset because they had lost control of the situation. All these people now weren't giving them their tenth every month, and they weren't, you know, uh, under their control. And they were trying to turn them back under the yoke of bondage of the ceremonial law of God. And keep in mind, these guys are already being taught to keep the, the commandments of God, to live in the moral right, the, the moral commandments, as Christ would have us do. If you love me, keep my commandments. But they were trying to put them back under the burden of the moral law. More on this on the Colossian studies, on the talk that on the <coughs> Biker Bible Institute page and on Neil's Corner page. We do the two-minute meditation, this is coming up. But here Paul says this. In this confidence, I was minded to come to you before that you might have a second benefit, and to pass by you in Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia to you, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. When I was therefore was thus minded, did I use likeness, or the things that I purposed, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, no, no? But as God is true, our word toward you was not, yeah, no, not at all. So Paul is defending himself against these verbal attacks, and he's writing under the authority of the word, and he has to let these people know, listen, I am an apostle. I'm sent um, by God. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, and what I say is authoritative. Well, I looked at this, and I, I uh, 
kind of read it over as one of those people, and maybe, maybe as the apostle himself would be writing. He says, verse 15, trusting you and believing that you trusted us. Our original plan was to come to you and to give you a double tree. A good relationship <clears throat> is more than just something we want. It's something that is needed to be our happiest and our healthiest, our most productive. I'm talking about a good relationship, to be the most productive selves. We need people who, usually it's one or two, that will walk along beside us. Um, friendships don't just happen. Now, you may meet someone like them, but a real friendship takes work, it takes time um, and energy and social skills that sometimes people have to learn. So here's the principles I drew out of this today. Now, th th these are not clearly stated, but I think you'll see that they're clearly understood in this passage. First of all, a proper relationship, which Paul had with these people, is based on mutual trust. Mutual trust. He said, look, we meant to come uh, to Macedonia, where 2 Corinthians was probably written from. We meant to come here, and then after visiting you, and then to visit you again on the way back so we could pick up the money that you collected for the saints in Judea um, <clears throat> with a collection for the church, because Paul had a heart for the needs of the people. Um, so the Corinthians were hearing from his adversaries, oh, Paul said he was going to come and visit you. He's wishy-washy. He's just fickle. You know, and that those attacks, oh, look at he didn't show up, did he? See, we've been trying to tell you, you can't trust this guy. You can't trust this guy. He said he'd come, but he's not coming. It's important in relationships we have mutual trust. Um, <clears throat> now, I remember in grade school, it was a long time ago, but I still, my long-term memory is good. In grade school, all it took to ruin a friendship was, do you know what she said about you? Right? Can happen today, too, can it? Even when we're not in grade school anymore. As we mature, though, we hopefully get past this and we can stand up to false reports. I remember my friend Ruth. She wouldn't hear a false report, would she? I remember in Greenville, if you were starting to say something about someone, even if it was going to be good, she would interject before you got it all out, and I was just going to be gossip. <laughs> I like that. I remember that. <clears throat> so, by the way, even true reports need verification. If someone makes an accusation and it's true, you still need to verify that. You need to double check. Over in Deuteronomy, God said, Deuteronomy 19, one witness shall not rise up against a person who sins. But out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, it shall be established. So, you know, don't just listen to someone running their mouth. To someone running their mouth. Because you know why? You get jaded. What does it say? It's Proverbs just came to my mind. The first person to give his report is believed quite often. But it's not often that it ought to be. So you've got to make sure you double check. Make sure you know your source and you go to the source. Later on in, in chapter 13, he said, <clears throat> this is the third time I'm coming to you that in the mouth of two or three witnesses it might be established. So he's using himself as a witness. Jesus also added another very important step here. Over in eight, uh, Matthew 18, it's the microphone. Over in Matthew 18, he said, if your brother sins against you, if your brother trespasses against you, you go and tell him your, his fault between you and him alone. I've often said it how many times. You, you can learn a lot from bikers about relationships. And one of them is, if you do something against one of the, those brothers, guess what? <clears throat> He's not going to go say, do you know what Steve did against me? <laughs> Nobody's going to do is just say, hey, freight train, we need to talk. Face to face, one on one, get it done. And that's, that's very important, isn't it? That's what Jesus teaches. If, if he hears you, he said, you've gained your brother. Now, if he won't hear you, he said, then take another witness. That two or three witness thing is there. By the way, I advocate taking one of their friends, just so you know that you're really trying to build a relationship, not just trying to bombard somebody. I think we uh, can be pretty guilty of uh, stacking the deck in our own favor if we're not careful. Face to face is the best way. And there have been times when <clears throat> the explanation of a friend, when you can look in his eyes, and you can explain what you mean, and he can see, oh yeah, this is the real deal, have, have really settled the matter. Other times it's shown that yeah, I, I did that. I did that. Proper relationship is, first of all, based on mutual trust. The second thought is, is really similar to it, and, and a part of it. A proper relationship then also gives the other party the benefit of the doubt. The benefit of the doubt. He said, when I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? In other words, because we had to change this plan, does it mean we're fickle? Does it mean we're fickle? 
I'm not talking gullible here, by the way. Giving the benefit of the doubt doesn't mean you believe every little thing you hear, right? I was going to actually write gullible on the ceiling this morning because you know why? If I told people I did, they wouldn't dare to look. <laughs> because, you know, that's what happens. In 1 Corinthians 13, 7, one of the things it says in describing love, the God of love, is love believes all things. Love believes all things. Well, what does that mean? Are you just a sap for every story that comes along? No. But it does mean that if you have a friend, you give that friend the benefit of the doubt. Let them explain it to you. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Paul's saying here, hey, do you think I'm kind of, well, was just kind of tongue-in-cheek saying I'm going to be there, that my yes means no and my no means yes? No, not at all. Uh, the Oxford Dictionary says this, benefit of the doubt, an acceptance that a person is truthful or innocent if the opposite cannot be proved. I'm sure that's how they'd say it. An acceptance that a person is truthful or innocent if the opposite cannot be proved. You got that? Boy, the way many friendships could be spared and saved if we one-on-one -on -one checked it out at the source and gave them the benefit of the doubt. I don't think you have to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And there's proven cases, right, where you know this person is consistently that way, but still, still, I guess I'd rather always err on the side of being gracious. While you might not give everybody the benefit of the doubt, you don't also have to assume the worst about everybody, and I think that's what's in view here, but especially with your friends. <clears throat> so in a relationship, friendships or friends must be given the benefit of the doubt unless it can be proven otherwise. Paul asks that of this church, guys, listen. Give me the benefit of doubt here. You know me. Because thirdly, proper relationship remembers past faithfulness. Remembers past faithfulness. There are people sitting in this room that if someone came to me, do you know what so-and-so said? I'd say, no, but I'm going to call them up. Well, I can use your name, right? Because I know the history. I know the history that we have. I know how things have been. It doesn't vary from that. Right? I know the history. So... <clears throat> Paul says, we have solemnly assured that as certainly as God is faithful, so we have never given you a message, yes and no. Yes and no. He could say it because he had lived it. Remember the story of the boy who cried wolf? You guys are all old enough to remember that story, but I'm going to tell it to you again because I like stories. The shepherd boy sitting up on the hillside, and it was a peaceful day, and the sheep out there, meh, meh, you know, just woolying around like sheep do, and he's sitting there, and he's kind of bored, sort of nodding off, and he'd wake up, and then he said, you know, it's awful boring up here. I'm going to get some excitement going on. Remember what he did? He cried out, Wolf! Wolf! The wolf is the sheep! All the fat men from the village came boogieing up the hill, all sweating and huffing and chuffing like a freight train. Had to put that in, right? And, and they get up there and no wolf. Ha! <laughs> little boy left. You guys look funny, man. Look at you fat guys exercising. Uh, you don't even need a gym membership. Uh. Don't cry wolf, boy. Don't cry wolf when there's no wolf. They went grumbling back on down the hill as well, you might expect. But later the boy said, that was so much fun, I'm going to try it again. A couple hours went by, the villagers are back there, and he gets up there and goes, wolf, wolf! Here comes the fat man, up the hill again like a bright drain. No wolf. No wolf. You better save your wild cries for the real thing, boy. Don't cry wolf when there's no wolf. <laughs> well, he just grinned and watched them go grumbling down the hillside one more time. <clears throat> Wouldn't you know it? About two or three hours later, just as uh, things are getting calm, he says, ha, a real wolf shows up. A great big one. Oh, fangs, the whole deal, you know. Missed out on Little Red Riding Hood. Angry as he can be. So he's going to have some mutton for supper, you know. Going to have some mutton. And all of a sudden he looks, and here comes this wolf, and the little boy goes, <gasps> Wolf! Wolf! No freight train. No huffing and chuffing. Just one little boy dragging his caboose around the hill, if I might say that. Because I thought he was trying to fool him again, right? So they didn't come out. Sunset, everybody wondered where the boy was and why they, their sheep weren't coming down again. They went up and they found him crying up there. He said, what's the matter? He said, there really was a wolf here. And the flock has gone everywhere, and I cried wolf, and no, nobody came. As an old man trying to comfort the little boy, he said, Now, son, you know, we told you before, don't you cry wolf when there's no wolf. Wolf. Nobody believes a liar, even if he's telling the truth. 
See, Paul wasn't saying what he hadn't always said. Paul wasn't one to cry wolf. He hadn't acted differently in the past. His, his past faithfulness was a testimony to his present truth. He was trying to say, look, remember my past. Remember my history with you. And don't let those who are trying to sow discord in your ears, don't, don't let them sway you. Don't let them sway you. I was hunting one time and, uh, <laughs> with my friend Sonny, and we were out over in Newport. It was a beautiful swat of land. He get, let me sit up on the hill underneath this comfortable tree where you could nod off if you wanted. And I sat there for quite a while. And the deer that he drove past me, I didn't even see it. I was... Sleep. <laughs> but he, later on, we got down into, <clears throat> I heard a shot, you know, and, and he said, <laughs> So I went running down there because I knew when he shot, there was a dead deer. It was way down in a swamp. I didn't know how to get out of there, and he didn't know how to get out of there, but fortunately, I had a compass. So he said, No, I think we go this way. I said, Okay, we started dragging, and then pretty soon, it just didn't seem right. I pulled my compass out. And I said, the compass says we should go that way, back to the car. I said, but I don't know if I believe the compass. And he looked at me and he said this, if you don't believe that nice expensive compass, then fold it up and throw it out in the woods right now. We believe the compass and we get out there. Why? It had always been faithful before. North had always been north. You know, I didn't have on any metal that would affect it badly. And, you know, yeah. I could rely on the faithfulness of that old friend Paul saying the same thing. I've always pointed you in the right direction. I've always pointed you in the, my past faithfulness. My past faithfulness is an indication that you can trust me now. So here in his, his greeting, he's encouraging them as to his integrity. And he can say this based on the fact that they knew he always meant what he said. <clears throat> then he says here, notice, as God is true. See, proper relationship is to model the faithfulness of God and the truth of God. That's the basis of having a good relationship. How does God relate to me? Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. He said, look, as God is true, so our word to you is true. Our relationship, our way we relate is based upon how God is in our lives. Sometimes it's a difficult task to remain a, in a good relationship with other people. Boy, there are some people, I've got to be honest with you, that I sometimes wonder, wouldn't it be better if I could just avoid them altogether? <laughs> There may be some that I do that, but nobody here, of course. No, I can't because God won't let me. And it's frustrating sometimes. He won't let me. I have to go, Romans 12, 18 says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, be at peace with all men. So i got to do that. <clears throat> but I have learned that his model in all of this is God is true and I want to follow him. What does God look like? What does... He looked like in his love for us. We love him because he loved us first. Romans 12, 18, I just quoted, Do you do your part as much as lieth in you live at peace with all men? You cannot fix every relationship. Even God can't fix every relationship because why? It takes two, doesn't it? It takes two to actually mend a relationship. No matter how hard you try, some people will not allow you to become close to them. People can be toxic. And sometimes there's a separation that happens. But even those people, from your perspective, need to be forgiven. Okay. That does not mean relationship. It means that you have taken this debt that you feel they owe you and said, God, I want you to take this debt. It's yours now. Huh? That's right. It's a canceling the debt that they owe you. And by the way, that Romans chapter 12 passage down in the next section, you know what it says? Dearly beloved, avenge not. Either give place to wrath, for vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. This sweet little girl over here, this woman that I'm married to, she's a doll. Someone used to steal her, what were they, um, malted milk balls. Her family wasn't wealthy, but they got malted milk balls to school, and somebody kept stealing them. Her family also raised goats. Do I have to tell you the rest of the story? This sweet little blonde chick over here, to whom I am married, <laughs> had a whole box full of dried goat doo-doo stolen by some kid. I hope they liked them. <laughs> Vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. You know? Therefore, if you're under me hunger, feed him, doesn't mean give him goat doo-doo, okay? Just saying. If 
you thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, you'll hit coals of fire in his head. Hopefully, in other words, bring shame to him. But then it says this, don't be overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Church, we're going to need that in this day. Love overcomes much, doesn't it? He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Restored relationship doesn't just come when you forgive, but forgiveness is essential for your mental health. It's essential for your spiritual health. When you say, God, I make a commitment to forgive, and that commitment is not to bring this up again to myself or to anybody else. I give it to you. That's hard, because as soon as you make that commitment, it's going to come up in your mind 50,000 times. And you have to remind yourself, no, this debt now belongs to God. No, this debt. It's a process that leads to forgetting the offense. Or the debt, excuse me, not the offense. But restoration of relationship comes when the other person says, I was wrong, will you forgive me? When there's repentance. Okay. We have to model it on God, because how do we come to Him? Right? You repent. You, you come to Him, you say, Lord, I have sinned against you. Come into my life, you know, forgive me for my sins. That's how relationship happens. God is very fair and just that way, and I think it's, it's that way. I have to ask myself, are my relationships built on the, the model that God has set? We came through 1 Corinthians 13 a while ago, and we read the description of what love is. It's patient, it's kind, it's, you know, puts up with a lot. And we said that God is love, so therefore God does that. God is patient and God is kind. God is long-suffering. I think we went back to the 103rd Psalm, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all your iniquities and heals your sins. This, in that passage it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far God has put our sins from us. It's a great discussion there, a great uh, description there of a loving, kind God, one who is always there to pick us up. I love the fact that in 1 John 1, 9 it says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we serve. When I fall down, he picks me up. Was it Andrews Blackwood and Company? And when I'm thirsty, Lord, your water fills my cup. We had to dig that out. It's an old 50s kind of song. Jesus, you're so wonderful. You can play that on your bass, right? After well, it was considerable practice. All right, let's do that. Well, it's like this. I found a story, and I think you've heard the story before, but it shows me what God is all about. In World War I, there was an English soldier who watched from <clears throat> behind the, the, the revetments as his best buddy was out there and he got shot. And he saw him laying out there in the middle and <clears throat> the order was given for all the, the other British soldiers to retreat. He said, retreat, go back! And he says, sir, to his lieutenant, he says, lieutenant, he said, can I, can I go out and get my buddy? Can I go out there? So I said, you can, but I'm afraid it's not going to do you any good. Because he's probably already dead anyway. <sighs> it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. But go ahead if you want. You might die too. Are you ready for that? He said, yes, sir, I am. So he didn't care about the one. He didn't care about anything. But he belly crawled across there. Somehow, miraculously, made it to his friend. And he put him on his shoulders and humped him back to the, to the trench. And he was wounded in the process. And the lieutenant said, see, he's dead. That was a waste of time, and now you're wounded too. Was it worth it? He said, oh, yes, sir, it was worth it. Because I got there, and he was still alive. And he said, Frankie, I knew you'd come, mate. I knew you'd come. See, that's how kind of friend God is. It's the kind of friend that Paul wanted these people to be. These people to be. One who, you know he's going to be there. I will never leave you or forsake you, God said. I'm with you all the way, even at the end of the world. No. There's an authority and a power in that. If he's going to go with us to the end of the world, we're going to present the gospel. That's our, our main message, isn't it? The gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't change the world, but we can bring the one who can change the world one heart at a time and then watch what happens. So that's a little bit of like things that I drew from this passage. It's like I said, it's not... Um, Clearly here, but I think you can see if you read the scriptures that those principles are there. And I think God wants us to follow the principles that we draw from the Word of God as well, as I've been doing in this book. So, there. You are now able to go home.
Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we, we have um, your word. One, there's great teaching points here, but also, Lord, there's things that we, we see of, of attitudes and actions and ways that we're supposed to be. As Paul writes to this church and defending his good name against those who would um, uh, be against him, I just pray that we would read those words and realize that every word has something for us in it. And in this introduction, as he's defending himself, he's also showing us what kind of friends we should be. That our friendships need to be based on mutual trust and uh, giving each one another the benefit of the doubt, Lord. And also to look at the past faithfulness and then, Lord, be based on you because your faithfulness is always right and true. Help us to be the kind of friend who, when we show up in a time of need, will hear those words, I knew you'd be here. Just like you, Father. Just like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us tonight with our service from the Neely's Corner Church, 1260 Kennebec Road, Hamden, Maine. And may God bless you real good.